Hello, baseball fans, and welcome to the Locked On MLB Playoff Preview here. I am your host, Paul Francis Sullivan. As you can tell from my little graphic, for those of you who listen to us on YouTube, you can always call me Sully and follow me at Sully Baseball. I have a guest host today who is a friend of the podcast and is going to be my co-pilot today. What's your name? Sign in, please. Hey, what's up, Sully? It's Jeff from Locked On Reds. Jeff Carr, in case you want to know my last name. Man, we got a lot to talk about, we don't got we? got so much to talk about. It was a fantastic final game of the season, but you know what? I'll cover my thoughts about the end of the season and everything. For those of you who subscribe to Locked On, be, that'll be, that'll be uh, the, the show for tomorrow. This is the playoff preview. And what do we have going on today? We have ourselves a bunch of the Locked On hosts whose teams are going to the postseason are going to be joining us for the preview. You and I are going to talk a little bit about the day and we are going to discuss what is the poll we're going to be discussing. We got the power poll. Sully, we're going to look at the power rankings for all of the playoff teams. Looking go. forward to that because I know we are going to disagree with most of these rankings. Yeah, I, I we've already taken a peek at it and I'm always like, nope, nope. Uh, very emotional final day of the season. By the way, uh, you can follow Locked On MLB on Twitter, Locked On MLB Pods. Same handle for Instagram. I'm your pal, Sally Metzali Baseball on Twitter. Jeff Carr is at Jeff F Carr. Two F, three Fs. Three Fs. Three Fs. Three Fs. Because two Fs were not enough. No. Um, hey, Jeff, we're, just tell me your thoughts a little bit on the crazy finale uh, we didn't get the chaos that we were hoping of multiple tie games and 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 uh, tie breaking games that we could have had, but it was still a thrilling f- finale. Well, you know, Sully it was nice to see Nick Castellanos get to 100 RBIs and see Joy. Oh wait, never mind. Sorry, the Reds aren't yeah. in the playoffs. Dead coming. Anyway, yeah. As far as the drama goes, when it comes to the American League, I, I really thought there was going to be a little bit more. We might at least get one tiebreaker game type scenario, but just everything seemed to fall into place there late in all of those games because for a moment there, it looked like the Nationals with uh, is it is it Joe Adone. Ad- Whoever it was, he had before today. He had that was thrown a beautiful ex- pitch. Yeah, exactly as many games in the major leagues as I had, and yeah. he came in and stymied the Reds. Well, think about it: like the Red Sox and Yankees, both won in their final at bats, yep. and the in terms of those two teams, you got to give credit to. Yes, I know Judge got the walk off hit, but you got to give credit to the parade of Yankee pitchers who kept the Rays off the board, especially a day after they blew up, they blew them out on Saturday, that there was a bunch of times the Yankees were, looked like they were on the ropes and they kept the Rays off the board. And so you got to give the Yankees bullpen tons of credit and Tyone tons of credit with his bad ankle for pitching into the, was it the third or fourth inning? He did what you needed to do. Uh, And as for the Red Sox, the credit has to go to Rafi Devers who came up big with the two home runs, the home run in the ninth inning, put the Red Sox ahead for good, and also to Verdugo for hitting the game-tying double. And things looked dire for the Red Sox. We were down 5-1 and looked dead from the neck up. And uh, as great as the Nats' young rookie pitcher was, the Nats' bullpen did what they do best, and that is hand over leads. In the second straight game, they handed a lead to the Red Sox late. And uh, so, you know, the two franchises that everybody hates, the Red Sox and the Yankees, uh, at least be happy fans that one of them will be eliminated at the wild card game. So yeah. there you have that. And and they're both going to be sacrificial lambs to the Tampa Bay Rays, who are just heads and shoulders better than everybody else in the American League right now. Right. It's like, congratulations. You just made it into the playoffs and you happen to win our one game wild card. Tell them what they won, Sully. They're going to face the toughest team in the American League and they're going to lose. I, I don't see anybody beating the Rays, at least before the championship series uh, gets going. But I tell you what, it, speaking of the Red Sox and all that different stuff, let, let's talk about that power poll because we've been talking about this whole rankings thing and how we mm-hmm. disagree with it. 
Uh, coming up here, look at this. Red Sox dead last. So, by the way, fans in Boston, I don't think you're feeling super well about that. But when uh, you look... I, I, I'll just say, as a native New Englander, uh, I kind of agree with that. Of all the playoff yeah. teams, the, I mean, the one thing the Red Sox have going from a little bit is the fact that their bats may have woken up, but they can't rely on facing the Nationals' bullpen. So, right. I mean, that's what that's what helped them sweep that series. But uh, I, I actually agree with the Red Sox being of the 10 postseason teams being the weakest team. I don't trust their their uh, their pitching. Let's just, by the way, let's bring the poll back up for audio listeners. Some of us are not in the YouTube world. And please, please follow us on YouTube at Lockdown MLB. That's our handle. But let's take a quick look at that poll again because you have the Red Sox at number 10. We'll do this David Letterman style. Uh, at number 10, if we could see the poll again, uh, the the – the uh, uh, the power ranking. Uh, I confess I don't have it memorized at this point. Uh, so okay, we'll do this David Letterman style. Number ten, we have the Red Sox who will be facing the Yankees, of course, in the wild card game. At number nine, we have the Atlanta Braves who have the lowest win total sure. of any of the teams. And boy, they are happy of geography that they're guaranteed a spot in the division series, but the 106 win Dodgers are not. <laughs> Thank you, geography. Uh, number eight, the Yankees. I think that's a little, wh what do you think about the Yankees being that low? In, I think that's uh, a range? little bit of a disrespect. I think a lot of it has to do with what the bullpens look like for the last couple of months. It's mm -hmm. just kind of been a hodgepodge that they've kind of cobbled together and limped into the wild card. But I still think that they are better than at least the next team that's above them. You can yeah. make an argument for that sixth team as well. Um, and number seven, the St. Louis Cardinals who uh, Jeff and I were talking off screen about the fact that they completely torpedoed the drama of the National League wild card by channeling the 2007 Rockies and going on that winning streak. Um, the Cardinals, I mean, look, at they play incredibly well down the stretch. I don't, if they're going to face Max Scherzer in a one-game playoff, right? Uh, it's fine, seven, eight, who cares? Um, number six, you have the Chicago White Sox. I think that's pretty accurate. I think the White Sox benefited from playing in a division where several teams were tanking. And also, they played very well against bad teams and not so great against really good teams. That being said, if Carlos Rodon is pitching well, uh, along with um, Giolito and along with Lance Lynn, uh, they've got decent pitching, and they, and yeah. they can hit. So... Um, they may do well. Uh, number five, we have the Milwaukee Brewers. Tell me your thoughts on the Milwaukee Brewers. The Milwaukee Brewers, for me, I, if you were to ask me about the most talented team in the league, I don't think I'd pick them, but I definitely think they are the most deepest when it comes to their pitching staff. Like, even their long guys, if they've got a situation where Woodruff or Burns maybe gets into trouble early in the game, and Craig Council, who, by the way, is one of the better managers in Major League Baseball, believes that it's time to get them out of the game, they can rely on Eric Lauer or Brent Suter to really give them a couple of solid innings. I don't care how big the situation is. Those guys can pitch. So when I think about the Brewers, they have the exact recipe for what you need. They got a couple of really good hitters. Their lineup isn't really that scary, but the pitching is just absolutely phenomenal. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to – I think it's ridiculous or this low. I think it's yes. insane that this low. I think Eric Lauer and Aaron Ashby would be the number two and three starters for the Red Sox. Yeah. And they're coming out of the bullpen for the Brewers. And I think their lineup is good enough to score two or three runs a game, which I think is enough to win. Mm -hmm. um, I think the fact that they are not top two or three is insane. Um, but uh, we go to number four, which is Houston Astros, who I think are too high. Uh, this is yep. not a knock. I know Astros Twitter hates me, but um, I think the Astros did a nice job. And I think they the fact that they're matched with the White Sox is very, very favorable. It's a great matchup for the Astros. I think they match up wonderfully with the White Sox and will probably win that series. They'll probably find themselves in the ALCS, but uh, I would be stunned if they made it to the World Series. Yeah, um, if, it, if they play Rodon early and they get up on him early, they could win that series. Maybe not in a sweep, but I mean that that would be a very quick series for Houston. But number three is the team with the best record in baseball. 
they still no respect San Francisco Giants. <laughs> do you know what? I guarantee you there's still people saying, do you know what? I think eventually the Dodgers will catch up with the Giants. I mean, <laughs> at what point? How many games? Think of all the great Giant teams from the era of Carl Hubble, Bill Terry, Willie Mays, Willie McCovey, Jack Clark, Will Clark, Barry Bonds, Tim Lincecum, all those teams couldn't win 107 ball games. This team right. could. Holy This team Toledo. that was supposed to win like 77, at, I, you I, know, I, in spring training. <laughs> I thought the Giants were going to be a contender. I thought the Giants were going to be, uh, will cont- we're going to contend for the second wild card spot. Okay, I, I did. I, I, I respect him that point, and it didn't stun me that they became a playoff contender. But who saw this? No, I mean I'm no, with but- you. I looked at them in preseason. I thought, ooh, scrappy team, going to be fun to watch. They could sneak up on some people. They didn't sneak up on anybody. They blew everybody's doors blew off. Doors this off was enough. phenomenal. It's yeah, phenomenal. I mean, think about the, you know. Anyway, I mean, look at the. I, I understand not picking him to win at all. I'm not picking him to win at all. Um, yeah. but, uh, you know, at some point you got to say, what do we have to do to earn <laughs> one of the top three spots or the top don't two get no spots? Worse. Don't get no um, number two, when we're going to be talking to Ulysses Sombrano later, uh, Tampa Bay Rays, I, I think you and I are in agreement. They are just the best team in the American league. It's the Rays yeah. and everybody else. Um, I, I- I don't know. I mean, you've got to have some crazy things happen in multiple games for anyone else in the American League to sneak up and beat these guys. I think the Rays are my easy pick to go to the World Series out of the American League. And there there have been years, now to, to be fair, there have been years when a team is the heads and shoulders favorite and another team matches up with them. You know, I mean, obviously there's a bunch of the Atlanta Braves teams during the Bobby Cox years where a Marlins or a Padres just happened to match up with their pitching. Um, but the, the, and, and I think the biggest upset I ever saw was uh, San Francisco upsetting the Philadelphia Phillies in 2010. And then the Cardinals doing the same thing to them in 2011, because those Phillies teams should have rampaged to the world series. So while it is possible, I don't see a 2010 giants or a, waiting in the wings there. Maybe the Astros or the White Sox could get hot. I don't think it's a prayer. It's going to be the Red Sox or Yankees, quite frankly. Um, But I would be stunned, stunned if the Rays didn't go back to the World Series. I completely agree with you. And then that leaves us our top team on the power poll. And I think both of us, uh, probably if, if you're looking at equal situations, I think we both agree that talent wise, this is probably the best team there, but they just aren't in the same spot as the Rays and the giants, but the Dodgers, because that's the only team we haven't talked about yet Mm -hmm. are the number one team on this power poll. Sully, I think that this is way too high for a team that yes, I understand Max Scherzer is going to pitch this wild card game and he is an amazing pitcher and he was born for this type of scenario, but you're still talking about a couple of really crazy swings and the Cardinals could upset the number one team in the power pool. Well, I think the thing that could go against the Dodgers is the fact that if you put an Adam Wainwright on the mound, a guy who's mm-hmm. been there and done that and does not care, and the Cardinals have nothing to lose. If they lose the wild card game twenty three to nothing, no They're one would say a bad to. yeah, no one would say a bad word to them. Uh, if the Dodgers lose, then you're seeing the single greatest defense of a World Series championship since the days of Connie Mack turn into a one and done. Uh, the the pressure on the Dodgers is intense, and the pressure on the Cardinals is non existent. So uh, I do think LA is going to win, but then it's a one game. You're predicting one effing game. And I right. said, effing because I do not want an explicit rating on this, but right. anything, any team can beat anyone in one game, especially a team like the Cardinals who are on fire and, and anything be playing, playing super loose. So, uh, you know, it, it isn't, it's insane that the Dodgers and Giants cannot play in the National League Championship Series against each other. That is absolutely bonkers. Uh, and but that's a topic for another podcast. I think putting the Dodgers at the top spot, um, I, I, I understand 
the, the defending World Series champions just won 106 ball games. It's not like they're it's not like they put the Padres on top, but uh, I do think that the Brewers are way too low. That the yes. team that that team Milwaukee I think will beat uh, Atlanta, and I think whichever team gets out of the division series, either whether it's the Giants, Dodgers, or Cardinals. Uh, I think the Brewers are going to be better than them in the best of seven series. So I think the Dodgers are too high. I think the Astros are too high. I think some of the people who vote in this were too high. And I think the <laughs> uh, Brewers are too low. Yeah, I think the Brewers make it to the World Series for the National League. I'm looking at a Brewers Rays series, and I got the Brewers winning in seven. Uh, yeah, I, I yeah. love the Milwaukee Brewers in this playoff. The way that they match up with these different teams, I think they pitch better than anybody that they're going to face. And I think that they can hit enough especially because of the acquisition of Willie Adamas which I think was probably the best trade that anybody made this season and if the Rays play the Brewers it'll be only the second time in the last 100 years that two franchises who have never won the World Series faced off in the World Series now to be fair Milwaukee does have a World Series title when the Braves won in 1957 but who's counting but also keep in mind (laughs) that the Indians would look up and say, oh, great. The Milwaukee has had two teams win a World Series title in their town since we last won. But (laughs) two franchises that have won their share of World Series since then have been the Red Sox and the Yankees. And Jason Mastradonato and Stacey Gotsoulias in a matchup of two podcast hosts who need to have their names written phonetically for us all (laughs) to not stumble on us. Red Sox Yankees, the matchup, the rematch, the the battle in the back bay are going to be on the next segment where we're going to be talking about the wild card game between the two most hated teams in baseball and the matchup that TBS is so happy is happening. Hey, it's your pal Sully. Does this sound familiar? You've got one device that lets you catch the game. You want to watch another game live. You want to have two games going at the same time like we had all day Sunday. And then you got to stream your favorite shows. Then you're watching the team highlights on your phone. Then you've got your friends log in so you can watch all the good stuff. I want to tell you about a simple way to get all that entertainment in one place without the hassle. And it's a great way to finally get your TV together. What's it called? It's called Direct TV Stream. And it brings together your live TV and on-demand favorites together like never before. So you can watch all your favorite sports, movies, and shows all in one place. Direct TV means no more juggling remotes, no need to buy another device ever again. And the best part is there's no annual contract. So get rid of the clutter and the confusion and get your TV together with Direct TV Stream, you can learn more at directtv.com. Directtv.com, compatible device required. Content varies by package. Hey, baseball fans, it's Sully with an incredible app for everybody who buys gas that they need to know about. Get upside. My listeners are making up to 25 cents for every gallon of gas every time they fill up. Just download the free Get Upside app in the App Store or Google Play right now. Use promo code BASEBALL and get a bonus $0.25 cents per gallon on your first fill-up. That's up to $0.50 cents cash back. Don't pay full price at the pump anymore. Get cash back using Get Upside. Just download the app for free and use promo code BASEBALL to get up to $0.50 cents per gallon cash back on your first tank. Some people who drive a lot are making as much as two to $300 a month in cash back, and there's no catch. The cash back gets added to your account. You can cash out any time to your bank account, PayPal, or any gift card for Amazon or other brands. Just download the free GetUpside app and use promo code BASEBALL to get up to 50 cents per gallon cash back on your first tank. That's code BASEBALL for GetUpside. Get upside. Good for gas. All right. For our next summit, we are going to preview this amazing AL wild card that honestly just got figured out. We're talking about game 162 is where we had to get to to figure out 
that the Red Sox and the Yankees, yes, everybody's favorite pairing is going to be playing a one game winner take all situation. Sully and me are joined. Sully and I, how about I take English once in a while? Are joined Locked by on Grammar. Welcome to Locked On Grammar. <laughs> yeah, Locked On Grammar. Are joined by the host of the Locked On Yankees podcast, Stacey Gatsoulias, and the host of the Locked On Red Sox podcast, co host. Uh, Jason Mastro Donato. Guys, first of all, how are you doing? Is your stress level at a million? Is are are you cool as a cucumber? Where are we at right now? <laughs> I'll I'll defer to you, Jason. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm just glad I don't have to book travel plans. I thought I thought I was gonna have to go to Toronto or maybe go to Seattle. I didn't know what was gonna happen this weekend, and then uh the Red Sox took care of business because watching them play against the Orioles earlier this week it did not look good. And we've kind of seen this team play to their competition for so much of the year. Um, And especially the last couple of months, it seems like whenever there's a big game, they just fall apart. And the Yankees handled them last weekend and kind of put them into a tailspin. And then the Orioles gave it to them good this week. And you didn't know what was going to happen. So, you know, it it was not easy for them to beat the Washington nationals, which maybe it should have been. This is not a very good team. There's really like one player in this lineup that scares you. Um, and they had a guy making his major league debut who pitched pretty well against them on Sunday. Um, but they found a way to get it done. And it was kind of the way that their whole season went, that it was sloppy. It wasn't perfect. This is a flawed team. This is, in my opinion, not a particularly good baseball team, but they just find a way to win games. I want to say that there's, uh, the turning point of this weekend for the Red Sox, for me, at least, was the fact that Juan Soto's sacrifice fly was not a grand slam in center field in that game. I thought there was the sun was going to rise, the sun was going to set, and Juan Soto was going to hit a grand slam at that particular moment. And I was thinking it's Giancarlo Stanton all over again, who I think since we started this, Giancarlo Stanton hit two more homers against the Red Sox since this <laughs> podcast began. Um, he hit in the weekend against the Yankee, uh, the Yankees Red Sox series. He hit 48 home runs in that weekend against the Red Sox, all of them grand slams. And the, I thought for sure that Soto's ball was going to go into center field. And I just thought like, okay, well, uh, it's at least they got a one game against Toronto coming up. And when that stayed in the park and then let's face it, the Christian Vasquez triple may have been the Christian Vasquez triple and the Verdugo double this afternoon were the two turning points. Yes. I know Devers hit the home run in the ninth, but until those moments, the Red Sox looked dead from the neck up after being shut out by the Orioles who won about as many games as I did this year. And, yeah. and I think those two moments, the Soto sack fly, the Vasquez triple, and then Verdugo's double today uh, were the turning points for clinching a wild card spot for the Red Sox. I think so. Absolutely. And, you know, Verdugo has, he had just made a huge base running error earlier in the game. And the first five innings of this game, you're looking at it and you're like, okay, let's see the Red Sox ace, didn't show up, you know, basically, I mean, he was just trying to strike everybody out, ran his pitch count up and then started walking guys. And that was that the left fielder made a base running mistake. The right fielder injured his ankle running out to right field to play in the fifth inning. And it was like, what are the Red Sox doing? They're just coughing it up all over again. Like this is what they're doing. And so they need some big hits to bail them out. And that's what they've done all year. They make mistakes. They're not very good at base running. They're terrible at defense. Their pitching's been inconsistent, but their offense is good enough and their hitters have enough experience coming through in those moments in the clutch that they found a way to win games. And, you know, it's funny. Somebody said on on Twitter to me that, you know, it's too bad the Yankees don't have a soft tossing lefty who throws 86 that they could throw on Tuesday because those are the guys that handle the Red Sox lineup. Like Garrett Cole throws 98. Oh, they're fine. Like they've hit Cole a little bit this year, but it's the soft tossing lefties this week that just crushed them and they had to find a way to come back and win those games. I'm going to throw over to Stacy for this particular question here. Well, I mean, it's, it's more of a statement on my part. The, the Yankees faced a huge gauntlet where they had to play the Red Sox, Toronto and Tampa to finish the season. And they passed with unbelievably flying colors, even though they lost the series to Tampa, they had the doors blown off the dump in Saturday and they came back. The bats were dead. But the pitching shut down a team that scored at will just the night before. And I know Tampa had nothing to play for, but they they were playing hard. And I give a tremendous amount of credit for the parade of pitchers 
who came in after Tyon started and to get that critical victory today. Yeah, it was quite a performance and a little worried there just because of them using all those guys and then wondering if there was going to be a game 163, what Boone could possibly do for Monday. But thank goodness that's not happening. And of course, you know, everything that Jason was saying about the Red Sox, you could say about the Yankees. I mean, it's basically been the same thing for them the whole season. Um, The defense has been shoddy. The pitching has been questionable. Um, You have guys on the offense that you know can hit, but sometimes they don't. Um, You know, it's been a roller coaster of a season. They play down to their competition. If you have a junkie ball thrower, you know, pitcher that throws 86, they can't hit him. Um, I don't remember the exact numbers, but someone was saying that Michael Waka against everyone else has like a five, seven, six ERA. And against the Yankees, it's under two because he just was that kind of pitcher against them. And, you know, yeah, the, I, I can't get, I actually can't get over how well the pitching staff did today. And it was really one of those moments where y- you just, it was another one of those, what the hell is the offense waiting for? And then all of a sudden they came alive in the ninth inning, got those two hits, you know, Odor's was a bloop, but Rizzo hit a really hard ball that could have been the game winner, but because it was hit so hard, Tampa was able to throw it in. And, you know, I was wondering if they were going to walk judge to face Stanton and try and set up the double play there. Because I mean, <laughs> you know, if you've been watching the Yankees all year, you know, they've hit into about 8 billion double plays. Um, and as Sully said, the Rays, even though they had nothing to play for, they like torturing the Yankees. So the Yankees did have something big against them and they passed. Thank goodness. But yes, it took until the last, <laughs> the last inning, the bottom of the ninth. And there you go. And that's how they got into the postseason. So. I just want to say one thing. I think one of the biggest turning point games of the entire year that turned two franchises and maybe a Cy Young contention around was the Yankees victory against Robbie Ray, that if the Yankees lost that game, Toronto wins that series. The entire complexion of this weekend is different. Robbie Ray wins the Cy Young award. Today's complexion, everything changed in the game where the Cy Young frontrunner had a lead, I think of the sixth or seventh, and the Yankees came back to win that. And, from that moment, the Yankees controlled their own destiny in a way that when we look back at this season, that's going to be, I think, one of the big turning point games for the Yankees, especially if they move forward against uh, Tampa in the division series. Well, yes. I, I, okay, that's, I guess that's not a <laughs> that's question. My face. I mean, you know, it, <laughs> it's like, okay, great. They made the playoffs. And if they win the wild card, oh, they're going to face Tampa. Great. Wonderful. So, well, you know. well, what's your pick for the game? I mean, we got uh, the the late Chris Sale is pitching probably for, or is it Nathan Eovaldi? One of them is going to be pitching Evaldi. for Boston for the first two innings. And I'm guessing Garrett Cole is getting the start for the for the Yankees. What do you got? Garrett Cole pitches iffy and okay every other start, and he was iffy in his last start. So I'm thinking he's going to be okay on Tuesday. Um, but it's going to – I don't know. I I, th- I think it's going to be one of those, like, down to the wire, last second, something's going to happen, crazy games that ha- always happen in Fenway. So we'll see. I, think I, can't, so. I can't make a prediction. I really don't know. It could go either way. It really can. I don't know. It's one game. I, I think so, too. Yeah, it's, like, such a perfectly – uh, matched game. I mean, th- these are perfectly matched teams. They both play terrible defense. They're kind of inconsistent on pitching, but they have some hitters who know how to hit. Mm-hmm. And uh, the Red Sox have hit Cole decently well. The Yankees have hit Evaldi decently well. I think they're going to go to their both teams. will probably go to the bullpen pretty quickly in this game. Oh, yeah. And it's a good thing that we don't have the man on second in extra innings rule for the postseason because I think we could get some fun extra inning games, uh, including this one, that could make it pretty exciting. Yeah. All right. Well, guess what? Uh, the ratings should be high and uh, these these blood pressure will be even higher for anyone who grew up watching the Red Sox and Yankees. Stacy. and it's what w- thanks so much for joining the show and check them out on Locked on Yankees and Locked on Red Sox. And one of them will have the honor of being beaten by the Rays in the division series. So we'll see how that works out. <laughs> thanks, guys. Thank you. This guy's a total pain in my... Hey, I'm Connor Newcomb, host of Locked on Orioles, and Rays outfielder Randy Rosarina was certainly a pain in my butt in 2021. I mean, let's just get to it. He murdered the Orioles. He hit 448 
against the O's this year in 13 games. 448. That should not be possible. He had eight home runs and 19 RBIs against Baltimore this year in just 13 games. Literally everyone who came to the mound versus Randy Rosarena, it didn't matter. He destroyed John Means. John Means was the Orioles' one good pitcher all year, but it didn't matter. And I know most of you know Rosarena as the guy who dominated the postseason in 2020 and maybe the AL Rookie of the Year this year. But you know what he did that hurt even more and was probably even more impressive? What he did to the Orioles. I mean, we came to the point at the end of the season where it was just like, please walk him, but they didn't, and he continued to smash the O's. Maybe he'll do it again in the postseason as well. All right, it's your pal Sully. We're here at the Locked On MLB Playoff Preview Special. Jeff Carr is here, and we have ourselves a guest. And that is the happiest man of all AL fans in the Locked On Podcast Network. It's Ulysses Sombrano of Locked On Rays. How are you? you? You must be overwhelmed right now. How are you doing, man? Oh, this is great. This is great. Uh, as Brett Phillips would say, uh, baseball is fun. And it's really fun when you have 100 wins and you are the best team in the AL. I am doing just fine, Sully. You know, I will see, I'm going to give the Rays a bunch of credit because they – didn't have to show up for the Yankee series. They really didn't. They had nothing to play for. And when you clinch as early as they did, it's their right to say, hey, we're tuning up. It's not our problem. And yes, they lost the game on Sunday, but it was one nothing and a walk-off infield hit. I mean, they shut down the Yankees' bats for, what, until for eight and a third innings, I think it was. And they blew the doors off the dump the first two games. And you, know, you can't ask for more than two wins out of three in the Bronx. So uh, it was a great showing for the Rays. Uh, it just happened to be just a game shy for Toronto and Seattle. But uh, I think the Rays are going into the postseason just absolutely looking like the the class of the American League right now. Yeah. And the way that they did that Yankee series uh, was phenomenal, too, because they had won their division. They had secured the best AL uh, record. They could play like it was spring training. Uh, they gave Shane McClanahan the ball for three and then just one bullpen day. Shane Boss, two and a third, go bullpen. Today, Michael Walker with a five-plus ERA shutting down the Yankees, once again, only allowing one hit. Didn't have more than one hit until the eighth inning. So it, the way that they have shown up at the Bronx uh, really shows the, the, the way that they're just, you know, above the competition, at least right now. Right. Ulysses, this has been a crazy, awesome season from the Rays' perspective. Just seems like a complete team all the way around. At what point did you look at this and say, you know what? I think this is ours to lose. I think after May, because they went on a run of like 22 and 6, something crazy like that, and, and they won 16 out of their 18 games. They just they started showing up. Austin Meadows, who really was affected by the 2020 season he had COVID and, and started the the season late in 2020 he just picked it up completely and you can see now his final stats over 100 RBIs closing in on 30 home runs just a clutch guy the most game winning RBIs for the team and if not top five in the AL so it just a lot of contributions up and down the lineup and I think it was at the trade deadline acquisition when you do the biggest move in in race franchise history to get the boomstick to get nelson cruz into that lineup now the one thing that had always been the bane of the Rays' existence is oh they're they've got the pitching and defense can they actually get some uh, you know firepower in that lineup well now we see that if you add some bats to what the race can do very well they can win 100 games in, in, a, in the toughest division in baseball. So that's what happened in May. And then with the trade deadline, you really saw it happening. And, and you can see that this team is really, really good. I'm going to bring up a date, and that's the 4th of July. Because at that point, the, the Rays were in a slump at that point. They had, had been blown out by Toronto, 11-1. Uh, to 1. They lost another game. And then they were in Toronto on the 4th of July, which is, which is just wrong. You should not be playing a game in Canada. Uh, on the 4th of July, but that's just me. They, they lost again. The Rays at the time were four and a half games behind Boston and were kind of, were kind of scuffling at that point. And after that, they went 54 and 25 and really didn't go on a prolonged slump at any other point 
after that. And they leapfrogged the Red Sox. And at the beginning of the year, I said that there was no 100-win team in the American League. There was going to be a bunch of teams bunched between 93 and 87 wins. That was my prediction. And that was dead right for the Red Sox, Yankees, Mariners, Blue Jays, White Sox, Astros, and even Oakland. But I did not foresee this, especially if you told me they're going to lose uh, Charlie Morton, they're going to lose uh, Snell, and then um, Glasnow is going to be injured for a, a chunk of the season. And to say that that team would be the team that wins 100 games, I think just shows that, I mean, all due respect to some of the other manager of the year candidates, it, Kevin Cash is the best manager in baseball. This is the best run team in baseball. And quite frankly, uh, the pathway to the World Series for them was cleared with the elimination of Toronto because I think Toronto is the only team in the American League that could beat the Rays in a best of five series right now. It, it so, starts top down. Yeah. You're doing it exactly. It. I mean, it goes from the front office all, to, all, all the way down to the 26 men. And actually, it's not 26 men when you're talking about the Tampa Bay race. You're talking about 61 players used in 2021. 18 of those were rookies. 38 pitchers used. I, I, I mean, something that is the, it's it's. Uh, uh, unreal what really we ha we have seen from from Kevin Cash and company that so many arms um, a, a guy who was selling solar panels Jeff and Sully and everybody who's listening a guy who was selling solar panels a year ago is getting important outs for the race and that's Lewis Head a tremendous story a two uh, sub 250 RA with a dozen trips from AAA to the major leagues in over 30 innings I and mean, it, the it goes from top to bottom when you're talking about the race and I, if I just can use this analogy, and Jeff, I'll throw it back to you for a second, but the analogy I used on the show, and again, I like to keep my movie references current, was in Fantasia when Mickey Mouse in the uh, uh, Sorcerer's Apprentice scene was trying to stop the, act, the, the brooms by chopping them into little bits. And every time he chopped a little bit, each bit became its own broom. And then there were more and the more. Right. And that's the Rays pitching staff. Then once you get rid of one pitcher, three more pop up and dun, 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 dun. <laughs> they're carrying the buckets. Dun, 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 dun. And, and like I looked up and the, the Rays, you said they used 18 pitchers. They used 18 pitchers today. Oh, 18 and rookies. 18, 18 rookies. rookies. Look, at the, them, look at the rotation. Look at the playoff yeah. rotation. Shane Boss, <laughs> Shane McClanahan, Luis Patino. Uh, it's it's unreal that there's so many. Wonder Franco, Randy Arozarena. These are rookies but they that are carrying the race. They could make trades like dealing a veteran like Adamas, dealing a veteran like Castillo, and bringing in other players because you have a Wander Franco or you have – God knows how many other relievers waiting there. It, it yeah. really makes it for the depth of this team scary. I'll shut up. <laughs> they, I mean, they likely traded away a possible NL MVP contender, and they're still the absolute best team in the American League. And, and Ulysses, this has been awesome. But before we let you go, obviously you're kind of sitting and waiting at this point for the wild card game to happen. Who do you want to play? If I am looking at who the ace is on the other two teams, Garrett Cole or Chris Sale, Garrett Cole has to be used on Tuesday. That just has to happen if you're a Yankee fan. So you would miss out on seeing him twice if, if you're the Rays. However, Chris Sale can pitch game two and game five in the ALDS. So if I'm trying to miss an ace, it would be, uh, you know, the, the, the Yankees. But having said that, the, the Boston lineup is way more dynamic and more multidimensional than the Yankees lineup is. It's easier to create a pitching mix in a pitching plan against the Yankees than it is with that dynamic Red Sox offense. The Rays are beating either one and four. Either one. Yeah, I don't think it, I don't think it's going to be an upset. It, I don't think so. No, I mean yeah. I think I give just out of just out of respect to the Yankees and the Red Sox, I say it's not going to be a sweep. But uh, <laughs> gentlemen you know, sweep. Yeah, I think it's going <laughs> to. There I you think go. The, I'll take that. <laughs> yeah. So there you go. Well, look at, hey, Ulysses Sembrano is the host of Locked on Rays, and you do a fantastic job. And, man, the path is clear for the Rays to be back-to-back, to-belly-to-belly -back, to -belly American League champions. Uh, we're going to be talking about the other division series, which we know what the matchup is. And, yes, it's a World Series rematch 
White Sox versus Astros. The last time these two faced in a postseason, it was the 2005 World Series. Now they're meeting the Division Series. Life can be weird. Uh, Brett Chauncey and Chris Tannehill from Locked On Astros and Locked On White Sox, respectively, are going to be on that. Ulysses Zambrano, is there any other place we can follow you? Well, you can follow the podcast at Locked On Race. You can follow me personally at Sembrano Ulysses. It's going to be a lot of fun for race fans who have been with us since the beginning. And for those who are just getting into a Locked On Race, enjoy the ride. We've, we've been to the postseason for these last three times. It, it only has gotten better. We hope that they can actually hoist that. Uh, what is that, Jeff? A uh, uh, piece of metal that they call it somewhere in the th- MLB executive offices? right? Series World Trophy? Something like no, that. No, World Series World Trophy. Cup. That's the World Cup. The World one. Cup. World yeah, Cup. Yeah. Stanley Cup. <laughs> Lord Stanley's Cup. Lord Stanley's Baseball Cup. All right. There we go. Ulysses Soprano. <laughs> Good luck. I don't think the Rays are going to need it. This guy's a total pain in my... Hey, I'm Ash Rocker, Locked On Twins Podcast. Here to tell you the player who is a pain in my neck all season, Jose Abreu, Chicago White Sox. Abreu hit 323 against the Twins with an OPS over 1,000. 16 runs driven in in 16 games. He usually beats the Twins, and he usually beats the Twins at target field, but it was really enhanced this year. And there were a lot of White Sox. I think they scored approximately a bajillion runs against the Twins this year. A lot of White Sox that I could have chosen here. Tim Anderson was great. Aloy Jimenez made an impact in a very small amount of time, came back off the injured list, and beat the Twins badly in a series at target field. I mean, it could be anyone. Nick Madrigal, before he got traded, killed the Twins. Uh, Brian Goodwin, Billy Hamilton. The list goes on and on. Gavin Sheets hit a walk-off homer off Jose Barrios. This is a, it's a never-ending list. And then you don't even get into the pitchers. Lance Lynn, Lucas Giolito. Tough year. Jose Abreu is the pick, though. Go Twins. Our Locked On MLB Playoff Preview rolls on now with the ALDS that has already been decided. We are talking with the Chicago White Sox and the Houston Astros host, Locked On White Sox and Locked On Astros. We've got with you Chris Tannehill and H-Town Wheelhouse, better known as Brett Chancy, or maybe he's better known as H-Town Wheelhouse. I was going to say, it's the other way around. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) We get it all flipped one way or the other, but this is going to be a really fun series. I think both teams match up very well in what they do best. First off, I know that you guys have been excited with the way the season is in it for both of you. The White Sox had kind of sewn up everything a little bit earlier than the Astros did, but I think the Astros felt pretty confident in their positioning. So I want to start with you both. I want to ask a question for both of you, and I want to start with Chris. When did you know this was going to happen? What, What point were you like, all right, the White Sox got this? I would say, you know, it was it was a rough ride to get here. I know it's been a formality for, for most of the season, but the Eloy injury starting the season was was certainly a curveball, a monkey wrench thrown into this whole thing. And then Luis Roberts' injury, there were times early on in the first month or so where you felt like, ooh, this may not go as planned. But you saw guys start to step up, the first instance being Brian Goodwin when Rick Hahn picked him up off waivers after Pittsburgh let him go. And his first at-bat, he hits a three-run homer against the Tigers. So you kind of got that feeling then. That was like around May, and you're like, oh, everyone's kind of stepping up here, uh, you know, filling the void of all these massive injuries that, that they've had, and the train just keeps moving. I've used the analogy all season long. It is like hopping aboard a moving train, you know, and it's, you know, the rising tide raising all boat scenarios here. So it's been a rough ride to get here, and it's been filled with, with ups and downs along the way but I think this team knew that they were the class of the division very early on with all the injuries and it, it you know the starting pitching staff has, has just anchored this whole thing and kept them stable the entire season from my point of view I think pretty much after the trade deadline they went on a n- really nice run that they were not exactly playing powerhouses when they played uh, the Royals and the Cubs and the Twins but they, they won a bunch of games, and I think they at that point they put a little bit of distance between them and the soon-to-be guardians of Cleveland. And I one of the things I feel uh, it should be encouraging for White Sox fans for the last couple of weeks is I think they've, they've been playing pretty well, and they've been playing pretty well against Cincinnati. They, they've won, they, they ended the season on a positive note. I think I would be really worried if they kind of limped into the playoffs 
on a losing record. I think that they, they've got a couple of good starts from the starters. And most importantly, uh, Rodon looking pretty good in his last start. I think he, having him in the playoff rotation is, uh, is going to be a real positive. Well, we'll see about that. He's going to throw on Tuesday, and if, if you guys haven't been paying attention, you know, Rodon, the, the box score will indicate that, oh, yeah, it was a nice clean outing for Rodon, but the velocity was down more than just a tick. He was topping out. Uh, 93 was the highest he hit on, and he was wow. sitting around 90, 91. Now, he did sort of have a different game plan out there in his last outing where he was showcasing more of the changeup to keep these hitters off balance. But real seldom usage of the slider, which is his big out pitch, and, and the, he did not use that almost at all, I think maybe six times against the Reds lineup. So they're very concerned about him actually heading into the postseason, and I think you're in a situation here where he's going to have about a couple weeks here, almost two weeks from the last outing until he's scheduled to throw. Let's say they throw him in a game four four if they're fortunate enough to make it to that point if he throws in a game four I think they're very much it's just going to be all right how many innings can you go at full bore because you know he hit a wall around two or three weeks ago where he's been a different guy and they've been trying to do this as cautiously and as, as smart as they could possibly could with resting him and getting him six days of rest instead of five every step of the way and then yelling him for a, a, a long period of time but he's since he's come back from the IL, he has not looked good. And the results have been okay. But I think everyone's very concerned and rightfully so. Unless, you know, this is a guy also who's a free agent at the end of the year. He's a Scott Boris client. So there's a lot of layers here going on. And I think Tony LaRusa seems to be just done with it all. He's basically looking at this like, all right, just let me know if you're up or down like a football coach mentality. Let me know if you're up or down and we'll throw you out there. And he's going to throw on Tuesday bullpen and they're going to see what he can do. But I would not be surprised if he goes – later in the series and they piggyback him with Kopech or Ronaldo Lopez. Well, one thing at least visually for the White Sox that is positive is that the last time they won a playoff series was against the Houston Astros. And that was a very different situation. It was a World Series back then. Mm. But the Astros are back as the division champs. And H-Town, uh, I must say that uh, I give the Astros a lot of credit for – taking on the late charge from Oakland and late charge from Seattle yes. uh, that they clinched before making it more interesting. They got the, they won the games they needed to win so they can line things up that this weekend with Oakland became a formality. I think they even used Grinky out of the bullpen uh, to sort of give him a tune up. Tell me where you think the state of this team is, which has had, wild streaks it's very yankee the yankees have had wild streaks and the astros have had wild streaks where they've had winning streaks where they look like oh my god they were the world series is coming back to houston and then there have been times like oh my god they are not gonna are they even gonna be a playoff team so tell me the state of houston coming in especially against the team which i think is a pretty good i think is a favorable matchup for houston in the in the division series sorry sorry I'm not trying to trash the White Sox, but I think it is a favorable matchup for the Astros. No, um, I think it is. And I know early in the season when we swept the White Sox in at, at Minute Maid Park, the White Sox were not at full strength. And I think everybody in Houston that just has a pulse and watches games knows that and knows that at full strength, the White Sox do pose a very potent lineup. They have very good pitching. When their pitchers are on, you have to make sure you barrel the ball. And if you don't, the White Sox are going to shut you down because of the guys they have out in the field. But Lance McCullers Jr. has really taken on the role of ace as he signed a big contract extension this year and has really taken the leadership mantle. Because coming into the season, JV goes down with Tommy John. Um, Framber Valdez is on the IL to start the season. The Astros had this crazy hot start the first six games, and then they're kind of hot, and then they like, go cold. And then they heat back up. And then we lost Bregman for almost two months. And we're like, what's going on? And this team has brought up rookies, AAA players, that I would literally, I would interview them, and the next week they would get called up. And then the next week they would hit grand slams. Jake Myers, Chaz McCormick, these guys. Um, Luis Garcia, who is in the Rookie of the Year talk, who probably won't win it because he's not an offensive player. Let's not kid ourselves. But he's having Luis, a good year. He's having a really he is good having, year. Yeah. And this kid, 
when he gets in trouble. I've seen him get into bases loaded jams and get out of it in the next inning, strike out the next two batters. He has got this, we we call it the cha-cha slide um, you know, motion where he takes like two or three steps. It's like he's on a dance floor when he's pitching. I think it keeps hitters off balance. But you have Kyle Tucker who unlocked his swing where at the beginning of the year, every 115 mile an hour ball off the bat was in a glove. He opened up his stance and he started connecting. And I think, honestly, Kyle Tucker took such a big charge at the end that he deserves some consideration for MVP. Not that he should win it, but that he should get a vote here or there because of what he's meant to this team. Sully, the bullpen has been our biggest worry all season. Our starters have actually held down held it down very well. Remember, we lost Verlander the year before we lost Cole. And then, you know, like I said, we started the IL with Framber. But you've got Framber. You've got McCullers. You've got Urquidy, who's back and healthy. We lost him for a while. And we've got Luis Garcia. And we've got probably Odorizzi in the pen. We've got Grinky in the pen, at least for the ALDS, because he's not going to make a start right now. He's not ready. But I think Grinky in the pen is an interesting kind of dangerous proposition because he's so masterful and we have to keep the offense at bay. Um, I think going into the playoffs, watch for Carlos Correa. He just had a big send off today at Minute Maid Park. There were tears in the fans eyes and um, it was just, you know, Carlos Correa I think is going to contribute big time. So it's interesting. H-Town kind of read my mind a little bit on that one because I'll, I'll ask you that too. Chris, what is your biggest concern coming into this series? I think the health of the starting pitching staff. And I, I got back, you know, get back to the Rodon thing where you, you you remember that outing down there in Houston with Carlos Rodon where he shut the Astros out, out for eight innings. And they ended up losing that game because they weren't playing great baseball, as you said. But he looked – that's the guy whose stuff plays any time, any place – and all of a sudden, that guy is gone. I mean, we, we speculate that he's not going to return this year. It's, it's a different type of pitcher. And, yeah, when you're in the postseason, you open yourself up to variance, and anything can happen in a short series, you know. But I think you look at what was your biggest strength was your number one ace in Rodon, and now that's not going to be a thing. Um, but there's certainly plenty of things, as any baseball fan knows. You you look at your team, and you, you're, you're worried about everything heading into the postseason. But I, I think – when you look at the White Sox, how what's the pathway to them losing or getting blown out or just not being competitive? It's usually uh, an inconsistent bullpen. You know, the, the Craig Kimbrell acquisition you guys mentioned, that's been a real shaky going here for pretty much since he got here. Tony La Russa never put him in the closer spot, and we've been talking about that all season long about how they they mismanaged him the the entire season. And now you never know what you're going to get from him when they roll him out in the eighth inning. Now, I had speculated that maybe they're going to, when the ninth ninth inning comes, that door opens, Craig Kimbrell is going to be the guy walking out of it. But I'm not so sure now because they never truly put him in multiple safe situations since July. So that's a concern for me. The volatility volatility of the bullpen is always a concern, I think, for any baseball fan, for for the Sox specifically. I think that's a big-time concern because you know Liam Hendricks at the back end is going to get the job done. He's been awesome the past month. He hasn't given up any earned runs the past 30 days. So you feel good about that, but it's the bridge. Getting from that starting pitcher, whoever it's going to be, because Lance Lynn coming off an injury, Giolito you feel pretty good about, but Rodon, Cease, who's going to bridge those guys with the back end of that bullpen a big mystery right now make sure you check out locked on white Sox and locked on astros subscribe to those podcasts ahead of this series real quick fellas what do you think give me your quick picks for this series oh um if you're talking about who's going to win the series um i think the astros win this in four games i think we win three to one okay i can't back down now i picked the White Sox to actually win the World Series, and anyone listens to the show, hey. I'm not I'm not White Sox homer guy, yeah. but it's what it is. They've withstood all the injuries, and they've managed to stay here. You know, at the point where they're at now. So I'm going to pick the White Sox actually in four. I think they steal one of the first two, wow. and this crowd coming back home on the South Side, they cannot wait. They did not get to see their team in the postseason in 2020, so they cannot wait for postseason baseball. And I think it's going to be a fun atmosphere on the South Side. Jeff, do you have a pick? I'm thinking that the uh, – man, it's hard to pick these two teams. I honestly think that the really White close, Sox do. Yeah. yeah. 
I th- I think that the White Sox do eke it out, H down. I don't mean to rain on That's okay. Just rain, remember last I, year with the sub five hundred record, nobody picked us to win anything last year. So just well, remember H- that. And we're better this year. H down, well, I want the White you Sox I w- do anything ever. So H down, I want you and Astros Twitter to hear what I'm about to say. I'm picking the Astros in five. I think it's a tightly knotted series. I think it could go either that. way. And I think the uh, I think the bullpen is going to be a factor, but I think Grinky is going to be used the way that Bochi used Lincecum in 2012 as kind of a super reliever. And I think that that role worked for Lincecum in 2012, and I think it's going to work for Grinky in 2021. Thanks, H-Town. Thanks, everyone. This is going to be a great, great, and did I mention great series? That's going to be a lot of fun between great. two, two matched up, evenly matched teams. This guy's a total pain in my... Hey, this is Jason Burke of Locked On A's, and Yuli Gurriel of the Houston Astros was a pain in my backside this season. In 16 games, he had 20 hits. He hit. Let me read some stats for you guys. 357 with a 415 on base. He had a 933 OPS. He only had one home run. But oh man, it felt like all of his hits were just soul crushing. And the reason they felt more soul crushing than just a regular home run from Carlos Correa or Alex Bregman or Jose Altuve is because he doesn't strike out, he doesn't whiff. And his barrel rate on the season is in the ninth percentile. He's just dinking balls all over the field and it stinks, it's maddening. So get ready. For some Yuli Gurriel madness, White Sox fans, it's going to be a great, great time. Enjoy! Hey, it's your pal Sully, and I'm telling you, I'm having a lot of fun doing this playoff preview, but I'm starting to run out of some energy. So do you know what I'm going to do? I need myself a little boost of energy, and I am going to have myself, I'm going to have a built bar! I have a built bar, and I really love built bars. I, I had one left. I thought I was all out of them, and I was really sad, but I have a built Bar, so I'm going to make it to the end of it. And if you haven't had a built Bar, they're the best tasting protein bars ever. Now, there's so many great flavors. This is this new great one, which is uh, it's the real cookie dough. None of that fake cookie dough nonsense. This stuff is real. Okay, but they got so many great flavors, coconut, cherry, barcia, mint, brownie, double chocolate, salted caramel, strawberry, orange, cookies, cream, German chocolate, or my personal favorite, which is raspberry. They're all covered in chocolate. They're all delicious. And if you haven't tried all the flavors, well, guess what? You can get what's called a mix box where you get two of each of the nine flavors that I just mentioned right there. And they're fantastic. They're delicious. And they're also good for you. Okay, they get 17 to 18 grams of protein, 130, 180 calories per bar, four or five grams sugar, four or five grams net carbs, amazing flavors, all tasty, all healthy. And oh, order today, you get the grasshopper cookie, which is great. Or you can order the raspberry or the real cookie or whatever you want. Built Bar is the official protein bar of the U.S. track and field team, which I think is pretty cool. So here's our offer to you. Go to built.com and use the promo code LOCK15. You'll get 15% off your order. Use promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at built.com for Build Bars. They're really good. This guy's a total pain in my. Hey, what's up, guys? I'm your Reyes here, host of the Locked On Padres podcast, trying to take in the beauty of the outdoors right now to distract myself from what is the greatest collapse ever, the San Diego Padres in 2021. Uh, And look, a big pain in my butt player this year was Max Scherzer. And look, I know everybody's probably gonna be hitting you with all the stats and oh, we had this and that. And actually the Padres actually did well against him in his last start. So it's not the numbers side of things and not to get super galaxy brain, but it's because I know he should have been ours. Man first reported that he was going to the Padres and then that was kind of, it signifies the beginning of the collapse. So every time I see Max Scherzer out on that mound, doing mostly well, except for that last start against the Padres, in that blue, just depressing Dodger blue, boring, bland, just, just villainous uniform, 
it gets me very, very, very sad as it reminds me of all the darkness and sadness that has transpired this year for the Padres. Um, and then I guess others might be like, you know, Dylan Carlson and Tyler Neal of the Cardinals. Uh, not because they did particularly amazing against them. I mean, they did do pretty well against them, but, but it's more like those, I thought those guys were gonna be, I, I want Trent Grisham to be what those guys were this year. It just makes me sad. So just total sadness here, guys. But of course, you guys stay faithful and everyone who's in the playoffs to so go have fun, whatever, bye. Hey, welcome back. This is going to be the National League wildcard preview. And Jeff, I, I don't mean to be the bearer of bad news, but this does not involve the Cincinnati Reds in any way, shape, or form. Uh, I'm not I'm not mad at all. Son of I'm just sorry that's Jeff, been happening recently. Jeff, I don't I don't know what. I, know, I know this is. segment is supposed to be about the National League wildcard, but this is actually an intervention. And for the intervention, we have <laughs> invited Lucas Smith from Locked On Cardinals and Jeff Snyder from Locked On Dodgers to talk about what I will – I'll just go out and say it. It's the single weirdest National League wildcard matchup I've ever seen in my life. And for that, I'm going to bring in Lucas Smith. How you doing, buddy? Jeff Snyder is in front of the wall of bobbleheads. Welcome aboard. Hey, thanks. Happy to be here. Cardinals are in the postseason, which I didn't think they would be back in June, so I can't complain too much. Back in June? Try the middle of September. <laughs> the, True that. The, the, let me put it this way, because I keep what I call the summer score, where I keep track of since uh, Memorial Day, the days a team is in position for a playoff spot, that adds to your summer score. That's sort of the idea of it's Memorial Day. Hey, is my team in a playoff spot? You keep track of it. The Cardinals were a wild card team on May 31st and were not a wild card team again until September 15th. Team is about they right. went all June, July, August, and half of September on the outside looking in. And not only did they clinch it, but they blew the doors off the dump and totally, by channeling the 2007 Rockies, totally destroyed any drama in the National League wild card race. What it looked like it was going to be a two-team race between the Padres and the Reds. And, oh, isn't it cute? The Cardinals bought, oh, they actually think they're going to do something. And suddenly they won. What What did, was their final win total? Was it 90 wins? 91? 90 and 72. Oh, my. Yeah. 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 Did I mention? Yeah. So uh, that, that's, that's something else there. Uh, meanwhile, the Dodgers, the defending World Series champion Los Angeles Dodgers, put together the single greatest defense for a World Series title since the 1931 Philadelphia Athletics the, of, of Lefty Grove, Jimmy Fox, and Connie Mack. And their reward is to play a potential one-and-done game with the hottest team in baseball. Jeff Snyder, thoughts about your Dodgers? And the good news is they get to go against the pitcher who's 96 years old. So, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. But uh, yeah, you know, it, it's, a, it's a quirk of the system and it, it's been this way for a long time. And one of my biggest pet peeves is people who are fine with the system until it goes against them and then suddenly they hate it. And uh, so I, I'm not going to rail against the system that's been in place for a long time. Uh, Dave Roberts said on Sunday, he said, uh, we're going to win the World Series, and we don't really care how how we have to get there to do it. So, uh, you know, once the Dodgers beat the Cardinals on Wednesday, it's basically the same as if they had won the division. Uh, you know, other than not having home field advantage, but uh, I don't think that's that big a deal. Uh, you know, yeah, it, it's it's never any fun to have to play one game for everything because baseball, more than any other sport, any team can win any on any given day, and so, uh, but you know. That that's a flaw in the system, not a flaw in in this year's implementation of the system. I guess I have to give the Dodgers a ton of credit, though, because I'm sure that means a lot to them. But but when you think about the fact that they they were so great this year, and that the Giants played on an absolutely unreal pace the whole season, and the Dodgers basically matched them game for game, and you had a team that won 107 games and they didn't clinch until the final day of the season, just shows you that the Dodgers were playing at an unreal pace. And I know everyone said, well, they're such a big budget team filled with tons of stars. They didn't get anything out of Bellinger for most of the year. 
You had the Bauer fiasco. You had Kershaw injured for a big chunk of the year. Mookie Betts was not an MVP candidate for most of the year. Their MVP candidate was probably Max Muncy. And, and you had a stretch where Kenley Jansen was completely unreliable as a closer for a while. There were a forget, lot of things. There were a lot of things that went wrong for a team that wound up winning 106 ball games. Yeah, don't forget World Series MVP Corey Seager missing a bunch of time too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been a it's been a season of challenges, and basically what we saw was I, they tied the the franchise best record of 106 wins, 56 losses. You know, the literally one of the best teams in Dodgers history, and that's with all this this injury and non-injury related issues that they had to deal with all season. Uh, you know, it, it's pretty remarkable. And and the fact is if the giants had won 107 games each of the last eight years, the Dodgers wouldn't have won eight straight divisions. You know, the, the, the only difference this year is the giants outperforming the Dodgers as a team. Uh, you know, uh, I have no, no team is perfect. Uh, and you know, if, if you're going to deal with an imperfect team that doesn't win 162 games, this is about as good as you could hope for. I know we're not with supposed all- to look at, I'm sorry. I just Jeff, I'll let you jump in. I just want to say I know we're not supposed to look at win losses anymore, but any team whose number three starter is a 20 game winner, uh you you're thinking, okay, yeah, any other year you lose Clayton Kershaw, it's like, oh my god, what's gonna happen? This year it's like, oh, we lost our number four starter. I yeah. mean, it's that's mm-hmm. the kind of year that Jeff. I didn't mean to step on you. This is the next voice you'll hear is Jeff Carr of Locked On Reds. <laughs> well, and and with all due respect to Sully giving credit, which I'm sure could be a sponsored segment coming up here shortly. <laughs> when I look at the St. Louis Cardinals, I look at the hottest team in baseball. And my first question, Lucas, is how dare you? Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, actually, my question is, what's been the biggest factor in this winning streak, and is it going to be something that is prevalent in this wild card game? Absolutely. I think that, you know, when, when you win 17 games in a row, a couple things are going to go right along the way. And th- this Cardinal offense, in my opinion, was the biggest catalyst for that. They, they average over five runs a game in this month. They weren't even close to that number in any of the previous months. You have Tyler O'Neill, Nolan Arnato, and Paul Goldschmidt doing their best impression of the MV3 that the Cardinals saw in the mid-2000s of Roland Evans and Pujols. Tyler O'Neill's having a career year. When, when you have more than one person in your lineup that can beat you, it makes that lineup deadly. I'm sure... Jeff knows that very well because you have about one through eight that can beat a starting pitcher. Early in the season, the Cardinals had Paul Goldschmidt, maybe Nolan Arenado, and that was about it. And then now later in the season, you have three, four, five guys rolling. The starting pitcher goes in the day and says, okay, I can't let this guy beat me. Can't let, let this guy beat me. Can't let this guy beat me. The lineup just got so incredibly deep that you had to pitch to everybody. And the Cardinals were making you pay, and they were hitting a lot of home runs and winning games just by, by outslugging teams, which the Cardinals have not been doing, even in years past of division and postseason runs. Th- th- this team's offense is on another level right now. It seems like Tyler O'Neill is in the highlight reels every day. Mm-hmm. I mean, when I was thinking about the beginning of the year, if you're going to write down who's going to be a huge factor in September in shaping the postseason, uh, I didn't. Tyler O'Neill didn't make my top two thousand <laughs> names there, and yet here we are. I'm not saying he's the MVP. I think Goldschmidt and the the run that he went on where he was unbelievable, but it just seemed like O'Neill may be one of those spark plugs on the team mm-hmm. who just is in the middle of every rally, at least from this, from an outsider looking in and observing this, the recent winning streak. Oh, hundred percent. And he's part of this outfield of Dylan Carlson, Harrison Bader and Tyler O'Neill. In my opinion, when they are at their best and when they're all going all that, that's one of the best outfields in all baseball. Every single one of them can impact the game on every single level, both sides of the ball, at a, at a high level. When Harrison Bader isn't trying to swing for the fences and isn't striking out, he can impact the game with his speed on the bases. Dylan Carlson has a great glove and arm and a decent enough bat at this time. And like you said, O'Neill is in the middle of everything. Even when the Cardinals were, were losing a lot of games in June, Tyler O'Neill made a game-saving catch against the Dodgers to rob Mookie Betts. All three of these guys, just not against that. All three of these guys can impact the game at a high level. And Tyler O'Neill this season has been one of the outfielders that the Cardinals didn't guess right, but got right. Because you, you've got the Adolis Garcias and the Randy Rosarenas of the world that are leaving and making an immediate impact on their teams. The Cardinals were able to sit and wait with Tyler O'Neill, and he's rewarded them at bare minimum for one season. When you look at this team and Kind of talking about how good the Dodgers have been all year compared to how hot the team for the Cardinals have been here recently. The marathon of the 162 game stretch is who's hot at the right time. 
is uh, is this a dangerous spot, Jeff, for the Cardinals, regardless of Mad Max being on the mound? Yeah, I mean, I, I think what it boils down to is what I said at the beginning that anything can happen in one game. I do believe, even with the Cardinals' recent hot streaks, the Dodgers are a better team than the Cardinals. I think if it was a seven game series, I'd feel really confident. A five game series, I'd feel pretty confident. A one game series, you know, I, I don't. I don't think confidence is quite the word that I would use, uh, but that has more to do with the nature of the baseball than, than anything else. Uh, I think the Cardinals are a really good team that uh, is, is destined to lose a wild card game. <laughs> you know. All right. Well, look at, I think this is going to be an interesting series and here's my bold prediction. The Dodgers will beat the Cardinals on a home run walk off by Albert Pujols. So that was my prediction. Um, hey, let's give a big thanks to Jeff Snyder. And let's give a big thanks to Lucas Smith. We're going to be talking with Ben Kaspik, who is the host of Locked On Giants. Remember the Giants? You know, the team with the best team in the record of baseball. They have a lot of oh. the top of our power <laughs> rankings here. Hey, thanks so much and have fun at uh, the wild card game. And uh, boy, uh, what a weird matchup it's going to be. This guy's a total pain in my... Miller Thomas of Locked On Dimebacks here. And the biggest pain in my butt in 2021, Mike Yastrzemski of the Giants because the dude has crushed my team the whole season. He has more hits, home runs, and RBIs against the D-backs than any other team he's faced this season. And do you remember that game back in June? The D-backs were on a 20 game road losing streak. They were trying to avoid the all time record and it looked like they were going to do that. They were up three runs in the bottom of the eighth, two outs, Yes, the bases were loaded for the Giants, but the D-backs still had a great opportunity. And that was until Yastrzemski strutted himself up to the plate and crushed the pitch out of the stadium. Grand slam, not just any grand slam, his first career grand slam. D-backs go on to lose that game. They go on to set the all-time road losing streak record. And Mike Yastrzemski was a big part of that. So because of that, Yastrzemski, you're the biggest pain in my butt in 2021. team in baseball in terms of wins and losses which team is going to have home field advantage all the way through game seven of the world series that would be my father's team the san francisco giants and what better person to talk to than my dad but unfortunately he's no longer with us and we don't have a ouija board we have the next best thing we have ben kaspik the host of locked on giants your team just won 107 ball games no giants team has ever done that what the heck? I can't believe it myself. I mean, 107 wins. The Dodgers tied a franchise record of their own with 106, and it wasn't enough. And it was this team, this 2021 team. It wasn't, you know, Mays and McCovey. It wasn't Bonds and Kent. It was, you know, Kevin Gosman and Anthony DiSclefani and Buster Posey and Brandon Crawford in their mid-30s. Uh, winning 107 games, the most they've ever won in franchise history. It's truly unbelievable. I really, I'm pinching myself right now. As a fan, Ben, of a franchise that a lot of those guys you mentioned came from, I just want to say you're welcome. Uh, yeah, that the you. Reds didn't want uh, those. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. Th this has had to have been quite a ride for you all season long because every time you turn around, you had this guy or this analyst telling you, yeah, they're they're fine now, but it's just not going to work out, or the collapse is coming. They're they're going to lose soon. Like. What what has been your your Zen uh, workout that you've had each day to just kind of keep calm through this season? Because this has been phenomenal to watch in that they never did. They they just got on top. They stayed on top and they rode it all the way to the end. I mean, it's been stressful at the end. There's no doubt about it because that Dodgers team just would not quit. And I think they ended the season on a seven game winning streak and. They they came back from a couple of four run deficits or five run deficits in the last few days of the season. So the Giants at a certain point, it became clear they were not going to get any help. And so you're absolutely right. It's it's felt like this team has had its foot on the gas pedal the entire time. And they had to. They literally had to because the Dodgers finished one game behind. And I mean, the head to head matchups with the Dodgers were unbelievable. Uh, the Giants went 10 and nine against LA needed every single win that they had. And some of their games, I mean, there was a robbed home run that was a 
would have been a walk-off home run by Albert Pujols that was robbed. And if you think about it, if that if that ball goes over the fence, then we're not sitting here talking about the Giants winning the division. But it really has felt like they showed up every day with you know the preparation that this new coaching staff does and the, gets the players ready is, I think, second to none. And they showed up every day with a plan on how to win that day's game, kind of micro focus like that. And it, it turned into 107 wins. I have to eat a little bit of crow here because I have been the, I've been not Gabe Kapler's biggest supporter all in the truncated season last year. I could not believe they didn't hand the car keys over to one of Bruce Bochy's lieutenants like Hensley Mullins or Ron Wotus or, or Roberto Kelly, like one of the people on their coaching staff. I thought, well, Bochy's going to leave, but they're going to give it one of his, you know, it, this was the, the transition will be easy. And they brought in Kapler who I did not think was did anything wor- worth of note in Philadelphia. And I was vehemently against the Kapler hiring. I wanted him fired after last year. And I have to do a mea culpa and say I was wrong. He did a fantastic job this year. And the, and his maybe he needed to have, like Francona stubbed his toe a little bit when he managed in Philadelphia before coming to the Red Sox. Maybe he needed to have that, a little experience managing a major league team and then have the things fall into place. Uh, but what I'll also say though, is that you, the, the giants are better than the sum of their parts. When you look at the, they look like a team that I thought the giants were going to contend. I thought they were going to contend for the second wildcard spot. And I thought they were going to be a high eighties, low nineties team. And you look at the parts, yeah, this team will contend for that, along with the Brewers and the Mets and the Padres and blah, blah, blah. Uh, To win 107 games, I don't see how these pieces add together to do that. But here we are. I know. It's truly incredible. Like I said, they've never had this many wins ever, dating back to 1883 when they came into existence. The most they had ever won was 106, and that was in, you know, like 1905. And so... Yeah, I mean, nobody really can see 107 wins coming almost for any team, let alone this team. I mean, preseason over under for them was like 75 and a half wins. So it is incredible. They got really good production out of like Brandon Crawford and Buster Posey, like star level production. And then the other thing they've done well is that just every single guy was good. There were there, They didn't give any playing time to anybody who kind of dragged them down at all. Every single guy was good. And so I guess if you add up not just 25 or 26, but like 35, 40 different players who contributed at some point this year, because, you know, the way this Giants team operated is it wasn't just a set group. They they have minor league depth as well. And, you know, there's some guys who are in triple A right now who contributed in a big way to this season who didn't get to be there today because the team is so deep. So if you add up just like 40 good players, it can lead to 107 wins. And and their run differential suggests that they were basically as good as they ended up. So they they legitimately earned this and at, still at the end of the day, even I who was who was much higher on on the team and Kapler and Farhan Zaidi, their president of baseball operations than most, my bold prediction coming into the year was 86 and 76. That was my bold prediction. And they topped it by 21 wins. Amazing. When you look at this playoff uh, scenario, the way that it's going to bring out either the Cardinals or the Dodgers, I don't want to ask you who you want to face because I think that uh, one would just be, well, you want to face the Cardinals or you want to face the Dodgers to get back at them or really kind of drive that final nail in the coffin. Me as a fan with nothing in it would love to see the Giants and the Dodgers, but break down uh, the matchups that the Giants have between those two teams. Well, on the Cardinals, Nolan Arenado and Paul Goldschmidt used to be in this division. And those guys, I think Sully probably knows, those guys especially, well, Arenado, they both tortured the Giants when they were uh, in the NL West. And so that's kind of an underlying story that would come into play if the Cardinals are, are in fact, the team that wins the wildcard game. I would say talent-wise, I think if you're trying to just win the, the series and you had to pick a team to face, I think you'd rather face the Cardinals. I think that's not a big secret, but you know, as a fan, I think Giants Dodgers would be really, really compelling. 
Giants have always played that team tough, even through this stretch of excellence that the Dodgers have had. Giants have played them, I think, about as tough as anybody, if not better than anybody, including this year. I mean, the Dodgers won 106 games and the Giants went 10 and 9 against them. And so either way, I think the Giants will feel confident. But, you know, we'll see. We'll just hopefully it goes, you know, 20 innings and they tire each other out. <laughs> Let me ask you one last question here. Does it feel strange to have a Giants team this good in an odd year? <laughs> a little bit. I mean, for a while there, for sure. It was 10, 12, 14, even 16. They made the playoffs but didn't make it any other year. So this is the first uh, playoff uh, odd year team since I think 2003. So yeah, yeah. 03 when they <laughs> lost to the Marlins. On yeah, the... won 100 games and lost in the first round. So yeah. you know so that's you a an omen that you know you can't just because you have a great regular season doesn't mean playoff success. But it's a tremendous accomplishment even if they don't you know win the World Series. What they did this year, I think they shocked the baseball world truly, and it's a tremendous accomplishment. Well, let me tell you something. 106 wins is not a guarantee for the division series, but 80 some odd is. And that's <laughs> what the Atlanta Braves and the Milwaukee Brewers are going to be facing off in the all former Hank Aaron team series that's going on in the division series. We're going to have Jake Mastriani and Dylan Short on to talk about that in just a moment. Ben Kaspik, good luck. With the Hum Babies going on, I just dated myself by referring to them as the Hum Babies. That was the what the 1987 National League West champions were nicknamed because of Roger Craig. I like to call his team. Oh, they're Hum Babies. That's but right. those in the days of Candlestick and Candlestick doesn't even exist anymore. They are condos. But one person who I think should be living in those condos is... Ben Kaspik of Locked On Giants. I didn't know how to tie that back. Thanks for joining <laughs> us here, and good luck in the postseason. Thanks for having me, guys. Thank you. This guy's a total pain in my... This is Ryan Finkelstein, host of Locked On Mets, and a player that was a real pain in the butt for me this season was Freddie Freeman. And really, it's every season with Freddie Freeman. Honestly, this was a better year. He only had one home run in 16 games. That was a shocker. The OPS at 790. You almost take that from Freddie because he's been so good against the Mets in his career. His OPS first career against the Mets is nearly 900. The dude's hit over 300 against the Mets pretty much every single year. Uh, he has 28 career home runs against the Mets in 186 games, over 110 RBIs. The dude is a nightmare anytime he steps into the box. He's also good at defense. He's also a good guy. He makes you almost like him, which isn't good because you want to hate him because he's a division rival. So Freddie Freeman will always be a pain in the butt. I certainly hope he signs elsewhere uh, when he becomes a free agent. But for those of you in the playoffs, you're not talking about that. Locked on Mets, we started talking about the offseason a few weeks ago. Continuing our postseason previews, the one matchup in the division series we know is going to happen is the Atlanta Braves and the Milwaukee Brewers in the division series. 106 wins does not guarantee you a spot in the division series, but less than 90 does, evidently. The Braves and the Brewers, the all-Henry Aaron series, and we have Dylan Short and Jake Mastriani from Lockdown Braves and Lockdown Brewers as our guests here. How are you doing, guys? Hey, doing great. I'm here as always, man. All right, cool. So Jeff and I were talking a little bit about this matchup before you fellows arrived. And Jeff, why don't you share what we both feel about one of the teams involved in this particular matchup? Well, Sully, it's strange because we did not prepare this at all, but both you and me agree that the winner of the World Series will be the Milwaukee Brewers. So that might tell you where we're leaning on this series. Dylan, change our minds. Oh, so I can understand pretty much exactly what you're thinking of is that nobody has a better one, two, three in the postseason uh, than going through Burns, Woodruff and Freddie Peralta. Mm -hmm. What I'm going to tell you right now is you may be shocked to learn that even before Devin Williams lost a fight with a wall, yeah. uh, a la a la Waskar and Noah, um, yeah. the Braves actually had a better bullpen than the Brewers, even with those two in there. So take out Devin Williams, and now you're basically praying that those three those three members of the Brewers team go eight innings and that Josh Hader does not have any implosions, knowing full well that Hader as a lefty means that if Ozzy Albies comes up to the plate, you now get to face superstar right-handed Ozzy Albies, Freddie, who can hit anybody, period, 
Jorge Soler, who just hits nukes at 118 miles an hour or what have you. I think the Braves are more well-rounded team, frankly, um, especially offensively. I think that the Braves are one of these teams that if you get good starts out of Charlie Morton, which is really why they brought Charlie in there. Charlie's one of the better postseason pitchers in baseball. Max Freed, who's an absolute stud. Um, there's he, He's got a lot of Charlie to him and that he wants the ball in every big situation. That third starter, Ian, Ian is going to make a big – change in this bullpen uh or in this rotation ian had some really good starts in last year's postseason he also had a pretty bad start his final one against la so i think it's going to come down to the starters honestly i think that i think the winner of this series i agree with you whoever wins this series wins the world series and i say that because i think the the cardinals they're going to pull their devil magic out and they're going to knock off the dodgers um but I think that this is going to be a very – I think this is actually the best matchup in the postseason, bar none. Uh, I think the two teams are very, very similar. Offensively, like I said, you'd be shocked to know that the Braves' bullpen was better than the Brewers. A lot of people would probably be shocked to know that the Brewers' offense was just as good as the Braves' offense for in nearly every category. So this is this is a very good matchup for both of these teams. Jake, what are your thoughts of him trash-talking your team like that? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I don't – completely disagree i do obviously think the brewers are favorite and should be because of those three starters that you mentioned because you know you said you have to hope they go seven or eight innings well i pretty feel pretty confident they will um and i still feel pretty confident you know craig council hasn't used josh Hader as a multi-innings reliever all year he's been really um you know limiting his innings his usage and i think that's going to come all off in the postseason especially with devin williams out uh i think you could see Hader, you know pitch multiple inning games in the in the postseason if needed um and, and you mentioned the offense this team was a very different offense in the second half you know they made the willie adamas trade. that was earlier in the year beginning eduardo Edbar right was really huge at the deadline the offense take off as well so and, and you really can't judge the offense off the really the last you know two or three weeks either they've been banged up avisel garcia's been banged up eduardo escobar rowdy telez you know, I've been banged up. This lineup hasn't really played together a lot lately, which does concern me a little bit. I was kind of hoping, you know, they'd have more time to gel this past week, but just, you know, haven't really been able to get the whole lineup together and healthy. Um, but when they are together and are healthy, this is, really is a good lineup, you know, one through eight and nine because Woodruff and Burns can hit too. So uh, it's a really good offense. Like Dylan said, I think the offense gets over – shadowed a little bit because of how great the starting pitching is but yeah certainly i mean they're gonna learn they're gonna lean on you know burns woodruff peralta hater uh, again boxberger who's been great all year is gonna have to step up into that eighth inning role they may have to lean on a young guy like aaron ashby to step up in the bullpen as well jake cousins has been good hunter strickland's been good so they have you know a lot of arms out there some good depth in the the pitching staff as well. Eric Lauer have been really amazing as well. So they have depth even in the starting uh, rotation as well. Adrian Hauser has been good. So, I mean, they just have a, a lot of depth at pitching. I think the lineup, you know, at full strength is very deep as well. I want to point out one thing that is truly remarkable about Atlanta's run because, you know, remember this was a team that I believe was sub 500 at the trade deadline. And one of three teams, actually. Yeah. And they they bought at the trade deadline. There was every reason, especially after the Acuna injury, to wave the white flag and say, hey, not our year. We got injured. They're not saying to to blow, you know, not to blow everything up. But I thought it would have been a smart move for the Braves to say, hey, they're not going to win this year. Let's take every player who we're probably going to non-tender or whatever, see if we can get a minor leaguer or two out of it, wave the white flag, and regroup for next year. And they did the exact opposite. And bringing in Solaire turned out to be one of the biggest under-the-radar best trades made in you know it's funny what people try to say who won the trade deadline nobody was talking about jorge soler being picked up by the braves but he turned out to be a tremendous piece and the fact that they bought they took over the the division in the middle of august and they were helped by the collapse of the mets but they took control of the division and swept the phillies when they needed to or they beat the phillies when they needed to beat them and Taking a look at their record, they're sub-90 wins, but you take a look at their last month and a half, and they're right alongside any of the powerhouse teams. 
And you take a look at their run differential. And I think it's plus 126 on the year. They've, they've scored plenty of runs. Their Pythagorean record, if you get into anything like that, is 90-plus wins, which is mm-hmm. generally what it was. Now, Sully, you and I have talked a few times this year. I thought they were a 100-win ball club, obviously with Acuna. Um, I certainly yeah. think that this year they played below expectations. I think what you saw in the second half was a lot more like what we expected most of the season to be. Now, you can talk about losing Acuna. You can obviously talk about what happened with Marcelo Zunia, uh, Zuna, losing Mike yeah. Soroka, seven different catchers. There's a lot of things that went wrong um i don't think that that really i don't i don't think that that's a good excuse because even without those like like you and i mentioned when we talked about should the Braves sell or not um yeah. this this and team I, was I always was i turned out to be wrong i thought they I mean, should have sold you know this team I, was I'll, all, I'll always the most balanced they were always the most well-balanced team in the division and just mm-hmm. because they weren't performing they could not get all three phases working at the same time in games. And it was just at that point, you could tell it clearly got in their heads. I mean, they had that stretch right before the all-star break was 17 consecutive games of alternating wins and losses where they just could not string together a run. And sometimes that's, sometimes that happens for, for young teams that kind of jump ahead of themselves, like coming off of last season where they were two innings away from a world series that personally, I think they would have won, uh, it, it can get, it can get tough when you're not playing the way that you think that you should be playing overall though. I think, I mean, I'm going to mess with the Brewers a little bit, obviously, because we're, we're matching up here. Uh, and the NL Central is kind of not good either. But the NL East is certainly no, no strongman division either. So I, actually, I think that these are, these are two teams that if you were to take them both and put them into each other's division, uh, I, think, I think the Brewers would probably, the Brewers would probably win a few more games. Now, I think, you'd, I think you'd still be looking at very similar teams. I think that you could pick these two teams up and put them in pretty much any other division, aside from maybe the West, and you'd see them have very similar records. I think they're very, very close together. Uh, it's actually my favorite one, to, not just because I'm a Braves fan, but as a baseball fan, this is actually the one that I think is the most compelling to watch. Interesting. I like it. So to sum up really quick, because we're running short on time in this awesome segment, looking forward to this division series. What is the biggest concern for both of you? And I'll start with Jake. Uh, uh, Christian Yelich. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, it's weird to say that um, for a Brewers team, but I have no idea what we're going to get out of Christian Yelich. And I've been saying it all year and I, I still don't know what we're going to get out of, out of Christian Yelich. I mean, if he is the, MVP bat that he can be, then I have no doubts about the Brewers winning this series. But I mean, if he's the punch and Judy type hitter that we've seen the past, you know, month or so and not, you know, driving the ball into the gaps, hitting home runs, then I don't know because they, they need that big bat in the middle. Like I said, I know Adamas and Escobar have really helped out there to, to fill in that big bat that they've been missing, but he's the biggest concern for me. Devin Williams being out is a huge concern because it does leave, you know, a big gap there in the eighth inning. Like I said, I think Hayter may be thrust into pitch, you know, inning, inning in a third, inning in a two-thirds now because of that very reason. It's going to put a lot more stress on him and the rest of the guys in the bullpen. So that's probably my two biggest concerns. You know, what are they going to get out of Yelich and what's going to happen in those seventh and eighth innings now with Devin Williams gone? I think uh, for me, I'd say Christian Yelich as well, um, because it would be pretty prototypical Braves for a guy that's had an awful season, but who typically tortures the Braves to come out and get hot at the worst possible opportunity. Uh, I would also say, I would say Will Smith, but I'm just going to couch that and say Snicker in and of itself, because Will Smith should not be pitching your highest leverage inning. Uh, at, At best, he's probably third or fourth in the rotation for the Braves bullpen about who should get the high leverage inning, but he's going to be the one that closes out the games. And we can argue whether or not that closing is the highest leverage. Some people are going to say the final three outs are the hardest. Some people are going to say, no, just use your best guy to get the best outs. I tend to fall on the other side of that aspect, in which case Tyler Matzik and Luke get and Luke Jackson should be the two guys getting playing matchups essentially. Um, but that's not how it's going to happen for better or worse. It's going to be Snickers going to roll with Will Smith in the ninth inning and Every single time out there, he puts he he makes you feel he, he gets your heart rate up. So uh, I think the hard thing I'd, I'd say the the lineup, but I mean there, there's pretty much one strategy when you face these three. It's make sure you you make them pay for the three or four mistake pitches they're going to give you in a game. If you don't make them pay, you're not going to string together hitters. You're not going to string together hits and runs. You're going to have to get you're going to have to hit the long ball. So you're going to have to do something. They're not going to walk you, particularly Burns and Woodruff. So you got to take advantage when they make a mistake pitch. 
Well, we know that the spirit of Henry Aaron is going to be watching a series between Milwaukee and the Braves with a lot of interest. And we should all watch it because it's one of the most evenly matched series, and especially in a best of five where if you, the road team steals one of those first two games, it could make the rest of the series really exciting. Dylan Short, Jake Mastriani of Locked On Braves, Locked On Brewers, thanks so much for being part of the Locked On MLB playoff preview. Thanks, guys. Thank you, guys. Well, certainly this has been a lot of fun breaking down these playoffs, getting a chance to talk with all the different Locked On hosts from all the different teams. Also, super huge shout out to the guys and gals who made our videos talking about just teams that uh, players that just beat their team and, and they hated them. Javi Reyes, Miller Thomas, Connor Newcomb, Ryan Finkelstein, Jason Burke and Nash Walker. Thank you guys so much. You have helped make this show awesome. And Sully, most importantly, Big thanks to getting a chance to do this with you. This has been yeah. a lot of fun. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun to talk with you, Jeff Carr. You've been a friend of the podcast for a long time. You've been a guest, and now you've been co-piloting this with me. This was this was fantastic. We you know we should do this again. I am absolutely down for that. It feels like we keep taking our relationship to the next level. So well, I like that. Absolutely. Idea. Well, let's go on here. Well, this has been you could follow uh Jeff Carr at Jeff with a middle F. So it's Jeff with three F's. Two F's are not enough. For Jeff Carr, I'm your pal. I am at Sully Baseball on Twitter, Sully Baseball Podcast on Instagram. Talking about all the teams in the playoffs, which are now lined up and set up. This has been Locked On MLB's postseason preview. I'm your host, Paul Francis Sullivan, with Jeff Carr. What can people call me? They can call you Sully. Sully. And you need to keep listening to the Locked On Podcast Network, where it is indeed your team every day. Have this be your first listen, folks, to Deloo.